I believe we are getting ready for a landscape changing move of God that would shift the nations of the earth. And you get to take your place. Why? Because the Holy Spirit lives in you. And guess what? When you move, God moves. So discover how to take your place in the great awakening that is happening right now. Welcome to The Resting Place, a place where you will experience the supernatural presence and power of God both in and upon you, where you will meet face to face with the Holy Spirit in a tangible way and where you will encounter signs, wonders, and miracles. Join Larry Sparks, prophetic teacher, lecturer on revival, and publisher for Destiny Image today, as together we enter into The Resting Place. Well, welcome to The Resting Place. I am your host, Larry Sparks, and this show is all about teaching you how to create a resting place for the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. I am with somebody who I have great admiration and respect for, Dr. Che An. You are the apostolic leader of HIM Ministries. You have seen God do amazing things across the earth, but now specifically with an assignment in California, which that could be a whole show in and of itself, talking about what God is doing there. But one thing I did not know is that you were a real student of history. Well, I was a history major at University of Maryland, and then when I went to Fuller Seminary, uh, you had to take church history, of course, and I had an outstanding uh, professor, Dr. Bradbury, and uh, gave me a love for uh, church history. And so, but you know, ever since I was a young believer, I got saved in 1973, I would just read biographies and autobiographies of great men and women of God yeah. that brought revival. And I didn't know at that time that we were in a historic revival. We're the Jesus of, People the Movement. Jesus People Movement. Uh, I just assumed, because we had a Bible study with 2,000 young kids, hundreds getting saved every single week, and I thought this is normal Christianity because I was born again into that setting. And then when in the 80s, when the Jesus People Movement subsided, mm. by the way, historically, they would say the Jesus People Movement was 1967 to 1977. Uh, so in the 80s, things lifted, and we weren't seeing the harvest coming in. I almost felt like I was backsliding. I said, what's going on here? I'm not seeing as many souls getting saved. And, begin, and then I began to realize uh, as soon that, you know, we, we are in the presence of God. We always have the presence of God. And the analogy I like to use is whitewater rafting. Mm. There, I don't know if you've ever been whitewater rafting. Yes. But you know, when you are hitting the rapids, you got to really paddle hard. And to me, that's like revival. But then you'll go around the bend. You're still in the river. You're still in the presence of God. Mm. So you're in the, what the Holy Spirit's saying, but it's not as intense. Mm. And so to me, the whitewater aspect of it is like when God breaks in, heaven invades earth, and we call that a historic revival. But there's certain characteristics of what that looks like as well from yeah. a historical perspective. Well, and I want to talk about that because I love church history as well. I got my Master of Divinity from Regent University. Wonderful. Church history and renewal. And it, it's interesting because people talk about how they went to seminary and they jokingly say, I went to cemetery. Right. But I went, Dr. Vincent Sinan was my advisor. I Amazing felt like leader. I got a real impartation for revival, studying revival history because I realized, you know, God's no response respecter of persons, mm -hmm. but he's no respecter of eras in history as right. well. Like if there are people, and you were going to talk about this, these characteristics of sure. revival, I'm convinced that if there are a people who are willing to kind of do whatever it takes, as long as it takes, right. I believe we can experience this landscape changing revival that we've seen about in the pages of history. So let, let's dive on in. Let's sure. start. What are these characteristics of historic well, revival? What I have observed, and, and by the grace of God, I've been part of the Jesus People Movement, the Charismatic Renewal, that really was really 1958, even before the Jesus People Movement. The, the Jesus People Movement was 67. And then I was mentored by John Wimber. Wow. And I was a vineyard pastor. And Peter Wagner called that the third wave. That was another wave of revival. And then our church in uh, Pasadena, Harvest Rock Church, was birthed out of the Toronto revival. 
And of course, there was a real synergy with Brownsville. Mm. And uh, we also had protracted meetings. A lot of people don't know, but we hosted the Holy Spirit. You talk about the resting place. Yeah. It's so important to invite the Holy Spirit into your church, into your city, and honor Him. And so we had protracted meetings from 1995 to 1998. We started out with five nights uh, a week. Wow. Then it subsided to like three nights on the weekend. But nevertheless, we had hundreds of people, hundreds of thousands of people come to our conferences, our meetings, and people got blessed and healed and refreshed. And But we didn't see the kind of harvest. So I want to talk about yeah, that yeah. because the, the the, the truth is, is that the first characteristic of a historic revival is that the church gets revived first. Mm. Believers return to their first love. It's always, you know, 1 Peter 4, 17 says, judgment begins with the house of the Lord. So it's not unbelievers being awakened, it's first the church being awakened. And so we see throughout church history, even the church in Ephesus, you know, in Acts 19, we see one of the greatest moves of the Holy Spirit under Paul's ministry. All of Asia Minor heard the gospel through that apostolic center. And of course, all the churches of Asia were birthed out of that revival in Ephesus. But we read in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, one generation later, around 40 years, uh, that God writes through the apostle John, yeah. who ended up becoming the bishop of Ephesus before he went to Patmos. So it was Paul, just imagine if your senior pastor was Apostle Paul, yeah. and next is Timothy, his spiritual son, and then the Apostle John. And so you talk about incredible leadership, and yet God says, I know your perseverance, I know your hard deeds, your hard work, but there's one thing I have against you. You've lost your first love. Mm. And so what an indictment that in one generation of people who actually knew the disciples of Jesus, the apostles of Jesus, had lost their first love. So, but here's the good news. He says, repent yes. and do the things you did at first. And so, uh, so that's what the church needs to do. That's why uh, 2 Chronicles 7, 14 is such a major verse for the body of Christ right now. Mm. If my people yeah. who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, the church is compromising. It's just like the church in Laodicea. We have become lukewarm. We've mm -hmm. lost our first love. And, and so he says, if you turn from your wicked ways, then I'll forgive your sins and heal your land. So revival will come to our nation, but it begins with the church. It's not the White House or the Senate or yes. the House of Representatives that need to repent. That will happen later, but it begins with the church. And so those who are watching right now, yeah, yeah. revival begins with you. Mm. Charles Finney said, Revival is nothing more than a new beginning of obedience to God. Mm. And, uh, and what he was referring to is uh, there's a great verse in Acts 5, verse 32, uh, where the word says, the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey him. Yes. And so as we repent, we obey, we get filled with the Holy Spirit. That's how I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I didn't even know there was a baptism. I just made a fresh consecration when I was 18 years old, one year into my walk with the Lord. And I, I just said, Lord, I want to just really live for you and die for you. And I got empowered and my body began to shake. My hands became so numb, I couldn't even close it to make wow. a fist. I didn't know what was going on. There yeah. was no one there to unpack this for me. And I'm weeping and uh, just really, uh, and that's when I was called into ministry. I knew I was called to serve God vocationally. Of course, all of us are called to serve, yeah. but as a, a vocational pastor. And so, uh, so it begins with the church. The second characteristic. Well, before we go into that, we yeah. have about a minute left. Would you pray for those who are watching? Absolutely. Because I actually believe the Lord wants to breathe on that passion, that first love fire for them. Yes. So, Father, we thank you that every time uh, that you promise the Holy Spirit, your word says, repent. Yeah. Uh, in Joel 2, repent with weeping, fasting, and mourning in verse 12, and then verse 28, and afterwards, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Acts 3, 19, repent that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And so those who are watching, I want you to pray this prayer. Just say, God, forgive me for losing my first love. Mm -hmm. I make a fresh consecration to you. By your grace, I can't even do this yeah. apart from your love and your grace in my life. And I give you all my life. Yeah. I will love you with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength and love my neighbor as I love myself in Jesus' name. Now receive that by faith as you've consecrated yourself afresh to the Lord. Receive yeah. the Holy Spirit right now because the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey Him. Amen. Amen. We'll be right back.
Larry Sparks is a prophetic teacher, lecturer on revival, and publisher for Destiny Image. He travels worldwide, equipping everyday believers to encounter the presence of the Holy Spirit in their everyday lives, translating God's supernatural power to the spheres of influence they have been called to. Larry is driven by a vision to see the earth filled with God's glory. This will happen only as every person, touched by the power of God, learns how to become a resting place for the Holy Spirit and releases His power, prophetic strategy, and presence into education, government, media, arts and entertainment, business, family, and the church. As Larry hosts meetings and seminars, the presence of God moves with great power to renew believers, revive the lost, and send forth reformers to change the world. Check out his website for more information. Welcome back to The Resting Place. I'm your host, Larry Sparks, and I'm here with Pastor Che On. We are talking about characteristics of historic revival. Before we go into number two, because we've been talking about number one, which is the church repents, the church is revived. You know, I was thinking, I, I like to go back and study to the best of my ability um, these catalyst moments of revival. Like I was looking Father's Day of 1995 with Brownsville, and it's interesting because you watch the church service and it's not very spectacular. Yeah. It's there right on YouTube. Right. But it's funny because so many people sometimes will criticize revival because they say, well, where is the evidence of souls getting saved? Well, if right. there was ever a soul winner, it was Steve Hill. Right. But that day revival broke out did not necessarily have to do with souls. It had to do with Steve Hill talking about what he had experienced, what God had been doing in his life in Argentina, in the UK, and him really stirring faith. Same thing with Randy Clark at Toronto, right. talking about the works of God. Right. And then that provoked the people there, the church, to get revived. Well, you, you're bringing up a real brilliant point because a lot of people don't realize that the church getting revived could take even years. Mm. And so the Toronto outpouring was not known for a harvest of souls. Yeah, yeah. It was known for the Father's heart, uh, the Father's love being revealed to people. People came broken, a lot of pastors. Burnt were out, yeah. Burned out, they were discouraged, and they needed to get personally revived. And that takes time. And mm. so a lot of times we, we put a time limit to what we think revival should look like. So we have to really almost lay our expectation on the altar, mm. the, the point is, is that the church needs to get revived and yes. needs to get healed. And, and God's so wise because if the church is lukewarm and we see whole souls getting saved, we're going to replicate after our own kind. So That's if we're good. not in love with Jesus Christ, what kind of disciples are we going to reproduce? Yes. And so he knows that the church needs to get her act together yeah. and always begins with his people. Yeah. And so the first characteristic for those who missed this first segment yeah. is that the church needs to repent and get revived and get filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm. But the second characteristic is that it, that it leads to the harvest coming into the kingdom. Yes. Like for example, in the Welsh Revival in 1904 uh, with Evan Roberts, within the first six months, 100,000 people got saved yeah. in Wales. It's a small nation. But here's the key. You know who led them to the Lord? Mm. It was that youth group from Riot Chapel. Yeah. It was Evan Roberts and his youth band. They hit the pubs. They went to the jails to pre preach to those who were incarcerated. And people started to get saved. And they started to preach in churches. They would visit churches. And the word got out. And places would be packed. And these young people, and it wasn't like they were great preachers. No. One, one, uh, uh, thing that happened is that one of the one of the girls who had just got come to know the Lord, she was a teenager, and there was some testimony time uh, before Evan Roberts would preach, and she just simply said, "I love Jesus so much." Yeah. And the spirit of God fell. Yeah. yeah. And people just started to run to the altar and yeah. get saved, and so the harvest came in tremendously. And of course, during the Jesus People Movement. Uh, the harvest came in, yeah. and I, I feel that uh, God was working with the church because really, uh, since 1948, there's been a move of the Holy Spirit after yeah. World War II. Yes. The latter rain revival in North Battleford, oh, yes. Canada, um, the Hebrides revival even in Scotland, and then um, you have uh, the charismatic renewal began in 1958 with Dennis Bennett. Yes. Uh, and at St. Mark's Church also in Los Angeles, um, but. 
But when the Jesus people broke out in 67, the harvest came in fast and furious. And the reason why it was such a very dark, turbulent time, yeah, yeah. very much like today. Yes. And so you had the radical 60s, you had the summer of love, 67, you had Beatles coming in 64 and the whole cultural change and transformation, yeah. the whole hippie movement. And of course, that was my background. I, I joke, I may have been the first Korean hippie in North America, I'm not <laughs> sure, but I, I was a hippie back in, and uh, until Because you had like long hair? Well, I, mean, I didn't cut it for two and a half years. Wow, and wow. So I just trimmed it, you know, <laughs> just so it would grow longer, actually. But anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that was just, you know, our identity. We identified with a group of people uh, that wanted peace in Vietnam, that wanted uh, yeah. love, and wanted to use drugs. Yeah. And of course, uh, it was all based on self and was selfish. Uh, it became very violent. A lot of people don't realize that the, um, the May Day, the protests against the war in Vietnam, uh, was very, very violent. Because well, I was involved in that in 1972. When I lived in Washington, D.C., in mm. Maryland, would go down to May Day and protest against the war. And there was riots going on, bombs exploding. Wow. And it was just, you know, the, the Kent State massacre of four yep. dead in Ohio. I mean, all that took place during that time of the turbulent 60s. So in the midst of the darkness, and this is another revival principle, yeah. it's always dark before the light of revival breaks out. Yes. It's yes. Isaiah 60, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord's risen upon you. Darkness covers the earth, deep darkness, but the Lord will rise upon you. And then it says, nations will come to your light. Yeah. So the second thing is the harvest comes in fast and furious. And that's why I believe in the midst of this COVID, this pandemic, economic shaking, the protests and the rights that we've experienced, yeah. uh, that we are on the verge of the greatest revival. And I based it on Haggai chapter two, verse seven. Mm. I'm gonna shake all nations yeah. because every nation has been impacted by this pandemic. Yes. And then I'm going to fill this house with glory, the church getting revived. And then he says the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former house. Yes. And so we are in that period where I believe that we're going to see a billion soul harvest. I mean, the harvest is coming in already. Yeah. yeah. Globally. Oh, yes. You know, a hundred, a 200, according to Dave Barrett's encyclopedia, uh, around 200,000 are getting saved every single day, like 35,000 every day in India and in China. Uh, in Brazil is yes. another hot spot. I mean, Indonesia is the largest Muslim nation and it's now 40% born again. Wow. It is unbelievable what's going on. Yes, Our yes. Churches of 100,000, 200,000 in Indonesia, 35,000. And I preached at these churches, so I know it's, it's amazing what's going on. And so the harvest is coming in, but for America, this is where I'm just passionate about because God's called me, even though we are global in yes. our ministry, uh, we're in 70 nations with Harvest International Ministry. Uh, in 2018, God told me to turn my heart to California and the United States. Mm. And, uh, and I believe that we're on the verge of seeing the harvest. We're seeing souls getting saved. Uh, my spiritual son, um, Jay Koopman mm. with uh, Sean Foyt, mm. who I've known since he was like 16 years old. Yeah, yeah. They're doing Let Us Worship around the country and thousands of people are coming into this open air setting. Yeah, yeah. It's like Whitfield doing open air meetings again. And they're saying thousands get saved. Mario Murillo, my dear friend in Cal, uh, he lives now uh, in Tennessee. Yes. But, uh, but uh, he's been doing these uh, tent meetings in California. Thousands. The last one he did in Sacramento, he told me, he called me up and we were talking about doing something in LA. So we were talking and he said, uh, you know, if I have 150 pastors that are interested in being part of this crusade, that's a good, good yeah, yeah. meeting. Uh, if I have 250, it's off the charts. The last one, we had to cut it off with 900 pastors who came for the pastor's luncheon in preparation for the meeting in Sacramento. He wow. said, that's never happened to us. Well, well I want to encourage people, don't go away. When we come back, I want to keep talking about what God is doing right now, and then we're going to give you the third characteristic of historic revival. Don't go away. Good. Since 1983, Destiny Image has had a clear mandate. Publish the prophets. Over the years, the team at Destiny has identified and published some of the most cutting edge and pioneering supernatural books of the generation. Launching key leaders into visibility, 
and helping bring the people of God into agreement with Heaven's prophetic timeline. Every month, Destiny Image releases powerful new books that help believers understand and walk in the fullness of their prophetic destiny to be supernaturally conformed into the image of Jesus. Visit norimediagroup.com to learn about releases from Destiny Image and Harrison House Publishers. And visit destinyimage.tv for thousands of hours of on-demand video training and equipping on how to live a supernatural life. Welcome back to The Resting Place. I'm your host, Larry Sparks, and I'm here talking with Pastor Che on. Before we broke for the last segment, we were talking about what God is doing right now, not, you know, one day, someday, right. talking about what God is doing in the Let Us Worship movement with Mario Murillo. I'm seeing even with my friends Jesse and Parker Green with Saturate OC. They started in Orange County. Now they're going around the country to these different wells of revival. Right. I think of places like Fresh Start Church in Arizona or The Ramp with Karen Wheaton. Right. It's these hubs of activity for the move of God, but it's only increasing. It's Absolutely. no. I, I think what we're going to see is back in the 90s, you had Brownsville, Toronto, Smithton, H Rock, you had a few. I think we're going to see multiple, a, a multitude of places right. filled with revival fire. But to your point, with Mario Murillo, things that are kind of outside of the four walls. Too. Right. Well, Mario, uh, the last uh, meeting, uh, I know this is dated, but there was a traffic jam to his meeting, two hour traffic jam. In Sacramento. At, in Sacramento. And it was just at uh, William Jessup University, it was open air. And there was a traffic jam, and which is a great problem to have. Yeah. Usually it's traffic jam for sporting events. Yeah. So God is on the move. And you're absolutely right. We are in revival, the early stages. Yeah. And so we talked about the church getting revived. Yes. And so I believe, to be honest with you, during this even COVID period has been divine discipline for the church. Mm. And I've seen a lot of churches and even leading up to the election, I saw more people praying and fasting for our nation and yeah. repenting of their own sins. So I feel like we're really, really ripe. And then, of course, um, I think, um, as C.S. Lewis says uh, in his book, The Problem of Pain, he shouts to the world in pain when mm. they're in pain. In other words, he whispers in our pleasure. This is a quote from Lewis. Yeah. But he shouts to us when we're suffering pain. Yeah. And the world is suffering pain because of this lockdown. Yeah. It's not just the virus. Yeah. It is the economic ramification. It is the fact that you're at home, away from your family members, you can't see them. Yes. And of course, we're opening up in, in our country, but there's still many nations oh. that are still locked down, like in India, it's just absolutely devastating yeah. what's happened. And so in the midst of this, when things are going well, people don't cry out to God. Yeah. But when they're suffering, they are crying out to God. Yeah. And we are seeing more souls getting saved in our church, yeah. at Harvest Rock Church. Every Sunday, we're seeing new converts getting saved. Part of it is that they're trying to check out this church that opened up yeah. in the midst of the COVID because we sued Governor Newsom and by God's grace we won, but uh, they want to check us out. And yeah, so we have yeah. a lot of guests and visitors coming. But globally, I believe we're on the verge of the greatest revival. But here's the third characteristic, yes. and this is really important. Third characteristic is what we call reformation yeah. or transformation of society where institutions are reformed. Mm. And we're talking about when we talk about a given nation, we're talking about seven institutions. We're talking about the family institution, religion, yeah. church institution. We're talking about government, education. We're talking about business, yeah, yeah. Media, media, and arts and entertainment. And all of them need to be reformed. Yeah. And so God loves the world. He doesn't just love people, but he also wants to see good government, for example. God's the one who established government. Yes. He's the one who established nations. And, you know, we read about in Isaiah 33, I believe 22, where he is both judge and he's part of the lawgiver, yes. the, like the uh, legislative branch, but he's also king, the executive branch. And so you have like the Supreme Court, you have the legislature, you have that, that's God and his idea of what our founding fathers discovered yes. and implemented in this nation. So the point is, is that we need to reform this nation and society is transformed. So the classic example of how revival led to transformation of society will be Will and Wilberforce mm. during the Great Awakening. Now, of course, the Great Awakening started in 1738 with Whitfield Wesley, but a young man got saved under Wesley's ministry, and uh, Will and Wilberforce, he was a aristocrat, 
highly educated Cambridge. He was a member of parliament. And he had given his life to the Lord when he was a teenager, but rededicated his life when he was a member in Parliament. And he had an encounter with God. Wow. He knew why he was in Parliament, because it was like an aha moment, as he described it. He knew that he was to end the slave trade business, mm. which was a number one source of income for Great Britain. And, um, and so he tirely, tirelessly passed bill after bill every year to end the slave trade and got defeated every year because, you know, the love of money is the root of all evil. Yeah. And towns were created over the slave trade. So Great Britain had a monopoly. They bought out the Portuguese, the, the French, the Spaniards. They had a monopoly. They had exclusive rights to buy slaves or, or to get slaves in West Africa, sell them to the United States, then pick up tobacco from the United States and bring it to Great Britain. And they were making so much money, towns were created overnight wow. from the slave trade industry. So it would be like telling Soviet Union, Russia, I should say Russia, to find a different source of income than petroleum. Yeah. It's like, yeah. are you c c crazy? You yes. know? This is our number one source of income. So that's why it was so hard to defeat that bill. But what he began to realize is that we had to get members of parliament who are abolitionists yes. into office. So they started to elect House of Commons people to run for office, and eventually they were able to pass the bill, the Slave Act Bill of 1807. Yeah. But here's the point. The revival started in 1738. It was almost 100 years later with the Slave Act Bill, yeah. which made slave trade illegal, and then slavery altogether illegal in 1833. So 100 years before uh, you know, there was the emancipation for all the British colonial nations. Yeah. And uh, by the way, slavery was in England for like 900 years. Mm. The, the thing about it in the United States is, is that we ended in 150 years. And so we were way ahead. Of course, we had to have a devastating civil war. But the point being is that that even was led by the revival of 1858, the great Second Great Awakening. Yes. That was an abolition movement. And so we see how God used to awaken people to see the abomination and the injustice of slavery and slave trade that led to the ending of slave and the transformation of society. So well, we that's have about a minute. What, I, what I'd like you to do, because I feel yeah. Holy Spirit on this, just like William Wilberforce, touched with an encounter with God, touched in revival, right. influenced by revival, I believe those who are watching, there's a lot of people who are hungry for God. I believe God's going to touch right. them, but I believe He also wants to give them an assignment. He wants to deploy them into whatever sphere they're called to right. go and to be become like a William Wilberforce. Well, uh, the, the truth is, is that everyone has a sphere of influence. Yes. And you're to yeah. transform the world around you. And if yes. you're faithful in little, you could be faithful over much. But be faithful with bringing about justice, bringing heaven to earth. Uh, in, in your world. So, Father, I pray for that impartation, yes. that you would impart this reformation mantle upon the body of Christ, that every single man, woman, and even child will change and transform the world around them yes. as salt and light. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 And, Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. I thank you, Lord, even now, in the fires of revival, you are birthing a multitude of pioneer William Wilberforce revolutionaries who will change their nations and turn the world upside down in Jesus' name.